this. Okay. Um, okay, so let, let, let's get started. Um, so we're really pleased to have uh, our two invited speakers today. Uh, first one is Fire Chief Dave Winnegar from the Moraga uh, Orinda Fire Department, uh, which is northeast of the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and Dave has been there for about the past four years or so. And before uh, Moraga Orinda, uh, he was in the neighboring county, Alameda, uh, where he was division chief of special operations for uh, he was there for seven some years. So he's currently coming off, as you can see, from uh, uh, some fire line out in the wilderness. So we really appreciate um, Dave taking his time uh, to join us here today. Uh, the second speaker will be Scotty Strachan from the University of Nevada at Reno. Uh, Scotty has been there for about 15 years, uh, the last four of which uh, he's been the director of cyber infrastructure uh, in the Office of Information Technology. Uh, Scott is also the chair of the ESIP Enviro Sensing Cluster, and I think it will be more in that capacity that he'll be uh, talking to us uh, a little bit later. Um, here's a 60 second quick context for why this cluster, Agriculture and Climate, that Brian Wee and I co chair, uh, has been doing uh, in the wildfire space. So for many years, we've been focusing on tracing data to decisions, right? Um, but for the past two or three years, uh, that focus has been in the context or has been applied to, to the wildfire, uh, in, in the wildfire space. Um, and our particular interest is in uh, looking at the entire timeline of wildfire and all the phases and how data information knowledge can flow better across these phases. So data information knowledge reuse and repurposing. So uh, the focus today, of course, is on the actual fire event, uh, maybe a little bit before in terms of preparation detection, um, but we're, we're interested in general in this flow. Um, so, so this meeting, what we want to do is to explore common interests uh, and potential collaborations uh, amongst all the different uh, groups that are here today. Um, so with that, uh, so Dave, I'm going to share uh, my screen, and uh, you can just you know just let me know when to uh, uh, advance the slide. So Great. Here we thank go. you very much. Outstanding. All right. Well, thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity. One of the things um, we, we are very cognizant of here in the district is that while we have a great laboratory in which we can experiment, uh, there's some real limits on what we are capable of as a fire district or really any local government, uh, excluding the major metropolitan centers, uh, what sort of resources we can bring to bear um, as far as original research and development. But what we are confident that we can do is clearly articulate the problem set that I will attempt to, to share how I see the problem today, as well as offer um, a field laboratory where we can do things um, like put fire on the ground and um, sense the, the, the outputs of that fire that would be very difficult to do in almost any other setting. Next slide, please. Great. So um, this this <laughs> this presentation is a little bit dated, and I had to get in here and update some of these numbers because when I first put it together in 2019 or so, um, 17 and 18 were were some of the worst years we'd had. And so if we we look at the historical cycle, it depends on who you ask. Somewhere between 1.5 and 11 million acres burned in California before European development. And that, that occurred in the Mediterranean counties on a three to five year cycle and in the forested counties in the Sierra on about a 25 year recurrence. And starting around 1910, we systematically excluded wildfire. And then following the Second World War, we brought an industrial firefighting apparatus to play. And, and for quite a while there, we successfully excluded fire from the landscape. And while, but while we excluded wildfire, and the consumption of fuels and the regeneration of the landscape that's associated with wildfire, we didn't stop photosynthesis. 
And so we saw, especially in conjunction with uh, industrial scale logging, we saw this proliferation of either dead or diseased or drought stressed vegetation throughout the landscape that is just primed to burn. And so that period that we excluded fire is the anomaly while we allowed a, a, a bill that has to be paid to accumulate. And is now we're seeing it is being paid with interest. So in 2017 and 18, which were really watershed years, particularly in Northern California with regard to fire activity and people's awareness of what wildfire could do, not just in the wilderness, but in developed areas such as Santa Rosa and Napa and other areas that experienced major wildfires. In those years, the number of acres burned just barely approached the bottom end of the historical average acres burned. And in 2021, where we hit four and a quarter million acres burned and prompted no shortage of, uh, of hand wringing about this cataclysmic problem we have and words like new normal, even in that year, we just got to the bottom end of the pre-European range. And if, if you think about what that means over time, if the average that we should be, if, if the normal is somewhere between four and 11 million acres corrected for things like reservoirs and crops and areas that, won't, that are no longer available to burn, but it means we're going to have to be very comfortable with lots of fire on the landscape for a long time to come, because not only are we going to have, or is, is the, we're gonna to regress to the, to the norm, but we're gonna to have to make up for all those acres that didn't burn for those hundred years or so. And at the same time that we have this reality of not so much the new normal, but the old normal, which is just back again now, we have 3 million homes with up to 11 million occupants that are built in those wildland urban interface areas. And those homes and the people that are in them, those create an imperative to stop fires, a very powerful political imperative. Because while we could agree in the abstract that allowing natural fire to occur on the landscape is a good thing, the consensus for that and the support for that position falls apart very quickly when that fire is approaching someone's home. And even a small number of homes can have a very outsized impact on fire management and fire suppression decisions, which make it much more difficult in the field in the in the reality that we live in to allow fire to, to do uh, what it would do if left on its own. And at the same time with climate change, uh, we see a compression of the historical rainy season, which has accelerated the fire problem, specifically in the Mediterranean counties of California where the, the fires that cause the most damage, and by damage I, I'm referring to um, structures and lives, those typically occur in the fall during a wind event. And due to compression of the rainy season, we're now exposed to more of those before the onset of seasonal rains. And while we get Diablo or Fone or Santa Ana winds all through the winter, once some rain has fallen, no one really cares. But when we're exposed to those wind events prior to the onset of rains, that's where we see those fires that while not necessarily very large in numbers of acres, consume large numbers of homes and cause loss of life because they spread so rapidly. And just something to note with regard to, to how the, this slide is now slightly out of date. So I used to quote that 15 of the 20 most destructive fires in California history had occurred since 2010. Well, now it's nine of the 20 most uh, largest fires uh, by acres have occurred in the last two years and four of them are still open incidents. Just to give a sense of how uh, this is really coming to a head. Next slide, please. So here we see an example about how the compression of the rainy season has created a problem. On the left, we see the number of, uh, or the areas that are classified as very high and high fire hazard severity zones shown in red and orange, and then yellow uh, for moderate. So these are the areas that based on undated now, it's 2007 data, but these are the areas that we believe are susceptible to burning. And on the right side, we see the precipitation anomaly for the campfire uh, in, in the paradise area. And we see that in the area that the campfire started, it was at negative four inches of annual rainfall from the 40 year mean. So if the, the ignition device, that, that hot slag that came off of uh, a electrical transmission tower had fallen in, in anything looking like a normal year, it would have fallen in a puddle because there already would have been four inches of rain on the ground. But because that area was drought stressed and because the onset of annual rains was delayed as a result of climate disruption, the conditions were set for explosive fire growth and, and we saw the campfire, which uh, you know, a force of nature, just not something that can be fought, not a fire that no matter uh, what number of suppression resources you threw at that problem, you were going to be able to contain or to put out. Next slide, please. So one of the things that, that we've drawn on as we come up with our plan uh, for how we're going to protect the fire district in, in Moraga and Orinda, 
was referring back to my time in the Marine Corps before I got in the fire service is that when you create a defense, you always create it in depth. You never try to form a single wall that will stop the enemy. You create a series of interlocking and mutually supporting obstacles that are both observed um, and have the effect of slowing the enemy. So as the enemy approaches your obstacle belt, they're slowed and observation allows you to target the enemy. And we're, we're taking that same approach and we're applying it to the problem set in the Moraga Rinda Fire District and we think is applicable to other areas which is we, we create areas where we have modified the fuel bed through either prescribed fire or hand thinning or mechanical maceration or other measures that will slow the fire. We cover those with persistent observation that allow time to aggregate an effective firefighting force while evacuating the portions of the population that are at risk based on near real time modeling. And out of those, we, we start to create a, a setting where we can potentially suppress the fire and absolutely evacuate the people in its path because we prioritize life over property. And when those things are done in conjunction with home hardening and defensible space, we now start to thicken the line because it's not just uh, fuel mitigation projects and fuel breaks in the publicly owned lands and the open space surrounding the wildland urban interface, but the urban interface itself becomes part of the obstacle plan through the creation of defensible space and home hardening to prevent ember cast uh, causing home ignitions. Next slide, please. And just as a reminder, I, I won't belabor the slide because I'm sure everyone here knows this, but all fires start small. You see the campfires progression there in the, the first pace. And by the time you got to the four to 12 hour mark, that fire was unstoppable. But there was a moment when, the, when that fire first started where it could have been contained or managed. And when we, we, we acknowledge that and the need for that persistent observation, the unblinking eye, the fire we know about is a fire we can respond to, both to suppress if it's appropriate to suppress or to trigger evacuations. And the sooner we know about the fire, the more time we have, the, the more time on that time space curve that we can, in which we can do things. And the later in the fire that we become aware of it, the, the fewer options we have because the fire is now spreading faster than we can respond. And fires are, fire spread is limited to the inputs of terrain, weather, and fuel. That's it. There's really nothing else that goes into the, the spread of a fire. And we, we know terrain and we can know fuel in advance. But we don't know weather, but weather can be tracked in real time if we have the ability to process the inputs. And that leaves the ignition point. It's inherently stochastic where fires are going to begin. And as we know, that 97% of the fires in Mediterranean California are started by humans. So it's important that we have that unblinking eye that can pick up the fire ignition point rapidly, can confirm and validate the location of the fire, and maybe even give us some observations about initial spread rate, at which point predictions can kick in to say where the fire will be in one, three, five hours. And from those predictions, we can make decisions for evacuations, as well as our attempt to either suppress or manage the fire. But the missing piece here is the observation, because the ignition point is unknowable. And we have to have a way to see that a fire has begun. You can't model where the fire is going to start, uh, because it, it's a random event. Next slide, please. So here's, a, as I mentioned, this is the this is the fire district. We share a border with the, the city of Oakland and Berkeley. This is in an area that's had several significant fires, specifically the 1923 Berkeley Hills fire and the 1991 Tunnel fire, both of which were the most destructive in California at their time. So our our, our problem set is really interesting because we lie at the intersection uh, of several biomes. We have maritime influence. There are portions of the district are covered in fog every day. Others are not. And, and we sit right at that edge where Diablo winds start to touch down and the potential for extreme fire behavior occurs in close proximity to not only dense, um, but, uh, but very high value um, property, which um, and people with the, both the equity and the interest and the means to do things if we can tell them what the prescription is to protect their homes. One of the punchlines I use, if you look at the very far northern tip of the district in blue for Orinda, where it, it forms a little V pointing to the north, that's the line between local response area and state responsibility area. The farthest north home in that area, uh, as of a couple of years ago, it was valued at $20 million and has its own helipad. And so we, we like to joke with our friends at Cal Fire about if a fire comes off, even a small fire, comes off the watershed, the first home it's going to build is going to be a make this a, a very expensive fire with regard to property loss. And what are the, the measures we can use where we can see a high return on investment that can not only protect these lives and this property, but be, can, can be used as a test bed for what could be done. 
because of the, uh, the value of the property in this area, we absolutely have people's attention about what they can do to protect it. And we think that represents an opportunity to, to test bed some things and to do some experimentation to see what works and what doesn't. Next slide, please. So these, uh, these are the seven lines of effort that we're currently undertaking. This has been uh, our plan for the last two and a half, almost three years now. And, and the point of these without going through all of them is they're all mutually reinforcing. And there's a combination of things done in advance and things done after a fire has started. There's a combination of things done by government and things done by local residents. And overriding all is the seventh line of effort, which is education and outreach to ensure that the work we are doing and the, and the work that our residents and landowners are doing is all mutually supporting and is all driving towards the common goal of protecting lives and property. And I'd be very careful that the common goal is not the exclusion of fire. Fire is going to occur in this area. Oftentimes fire is going to occur because we lit it. We're aggressively using prescribed fire as a fuel management option, but it all integrates so that when there is an uncontrolled wildfire, we will have minimized its spread and, we, and where it spreads, we will minimize the loss of life and then minimize the loss of property that the community experiences in the face uh, of this event. Next slide, please. So uh, this is a little bit dated, but this gets into what we've been doing. Uh, and that the little drone there on the top right, you can swap that out for one of the uh, alert wildfire ground-based cameras or um, uh, MODIS VERS or the oncoming constellations of low earth orbit satellites. But if you move from left to right across the, the, um, the system here, on the left, we have, um, in this case, ground-based sensors. And with generous support from our friends at the Moore Foundation, and thank you to Jenny Biggs if you're on the call, um, we fielded, we developed and fielded a number of ground-based sensors that use temperature and humidity to detect wildfire. Once one of those gets a hit where it's crossed the parameter for being a fire, we then validate that there is in fact a fire, either through the use of unmanned aircraft, uh, ground-based cameras, or hopefully in time uh, with satellites. In April of 2020, we were able to successfully integrate our ground-based sensors with satellites for near real-time detection with video, where we were able to see not only the fire's location, but see a snap, a snippet of its spread rate, which was very helpful for our modeling. Once we have detected and confirmed a fire, that information is passed to a gateway up to the cloud, where the cloud queries the local remote automated weather station, pulls down local weather, specifically wind speed, wind direction, relative humidity, and live and dead fuel moistures. From that, a near real-time simulation is run to produce one, three, and five hour predicted spread, which is the, that first colored box you see underneath the local RAWs. That um, predicted spread is then overlaid against evacuation polygons. So we have an idea of, of which humans are going to be impacted by this fire. At the same time, over on the left, where you see the emergency 911 box, the information of not only the fire's location, but its predict predicted spread is processed and exported to the mobile data terminals of the responding fire units. So they know what they are going to and where it is anticipated to be spreading. Uh, one of the unfortunate realities uh, of our current environment is that uh, our report of a fire initially comes from a reporting party, an RP, who is usually a human, uh, an untrained human observer with a cell phone, and their report is always wrong. And so in essence, what we do is we tell that first due engine company, hey, jump on your rig, head north, look for smoke. And I think in this day and age, we can do better telling them what they're going to, uh, where that fire is and what the predicted spread rates are and what the anticipated impacts are in the populated area through that modeled spread. If you shift back over to the right, uh, once we've put together the predicted spread rates and the uh, evacuation polygons, that comes into a combined evacuation decision support tool that's intended to create a common operating picture between the firefighters who know what the fire is doing or is going to do, the police officials who have the authority to issue an evacuation order that firefighters do not have in the state of California, and the dispatchers who have the means to promulgate that evacuation order once given by police. So we're bringing police, fire, and dispatch all into a single common operating picture through a shared digital platform. And this is what largely what Zonehaven uh, was started to do and is successfully doing in, in many Cal California and Oregon counties now. And then the last output, once we've got that evacuation decision support tool and we've created that common operating picture between police, fire, and dispatch, then we trigger enhanced evacuation measures such as contraflow traffic. As you see in the south with hurricanes, uh, they apply uh, to the west for wildfire as well. Just the distinction is on a fast-moving wind-driven fire, 
We simply don't have the time to go mobilize the Department of Transportation and lay out millions of cones. We need to be able to do this in near real time. And in the district, we're doing that um, with digital signs that can flip over uh, to indicate the need for contra flow traffic because we know that our surface street capacity is inadequate to move the entire community at once. And we know we're not going to be able to build uh, additional lanes or new roads in this day and age. So we need to make maximum use of our existing roads. And baked into all of that as part of the decision support tool is the prioritization of surface street access, prioritizing um, evacuees over responders. So we know we need to get the humans out before we get firefighters in once a fire has surpassed a certain scale. And so we deconflict the routes. Firefighters will take a more circuitous route to access the fire in order to leave those critical evacuation routes open. So you don't have salmon trying to go upstream. Uh, it's unfortunate reality, but when uh, firefighters are responding, they use lights and sirens. And when people see lights and sirens, they pull over and stop, even during an evacuation, which can have a tremendous negative effect on uh, the outflow of residents. Next slide, please. So here's uh, a couple examples from our, um, our ground sensing uh, testing. Here you see one of our early generation sensors exposed to backing fire. So it, it has not seen the products of combustion because those are going downwind, but it is getting uh, radiant heat coming off the fire. So a, a, a specific profile. Next slide, please. Here we see a case where a backing fire and a running head fire are coming together. There's a sensor in the middle there. So here is a sensor that is seeing the products of combustion, specifically uh, superheated gases and smoke with high RH levels. Next slide, please. And here we see the outputs. So uh, one, uh, you see the box one, I'm sorry, top is, uh, is temperature, middle is humidity, bottom is temperature. So you see temperature spikes and humidity drops as they're exposed to fire. Uh, on the left side there, number one, is when uh, we're burning in control lines in preparation for the burn. Some of the sensors got an ancillary reading. You see slight increases in temp and slight drops in RH. And uh, two is where we get a backing fire. And so we don't, uh, we don't see any uh, increases in, uh, or decreases in RH until the fire is, is right up on the sensor because there is no smoke traveling in advance. And then three and four are two examples of a, a running head fire and then head fire combined with backing fire coming together. And, and so the point of this is we start to develop a profile where with temp and RH sensors, which are reliable, low cost, have very low power draw and very small data outputs, meaning you need a much smaller pipe to export the output, outputs, you can reliably predict fire within proximity to these ground-based sensors. And, and that became a really interesting case study in, in what could we do with a minimal sensor package to detect fire in the understory where it's not visible um, to things that are looking, particularly ground-based fires that are, or ground-based cameras that are looking out across the, the landscape or potentially looking upwind into the smoke column. Understanding though, that this is not a be all and end all because all the sensor can tell you is that there's fire at a point. Can't tell you anything about what direction it's moving. You would need extraordinarily high sensor density to be able to extrapolate that from sensors. These are strictly designed in areas where you have high values at risk, uh, say around telecom sites, in proximity to homes, those sort of things that can say, hey, hey, look over here, there's a fire and can cue uh, more exquisite systems such as um, cameras, satellites, et cetera, to look in that area. And, and really dig in on what's there. We believe this is a transitory technology that'll be made largely obsolete uh, by low earth orbit satellites with one exception, and that's potential commercial applications. So things like uh, a simple sensor mounted on the fence lines of properties uh, of homes that integrate with a home hub system through the existing Wi-Fi that can be used as a last resort, say trigger the smart uh, smoke detectors to wake up the residents if they're still there, uh, to do things like activate irrigation systems as the fire arrives, and to inform uh, local authorities about a fire's progression through uh, developed areas. I think that's a very compelling application for something like this. Um, unfortunately, we've had zero takers from the home hub, major home hub manufacturers, mostly because of concern about liability, as far as I can tell. Next slide. And here's just a picture of our Gen 2 sensors in proxy. You can see a, a picket line running down the, uh, the, the edge of the burn there underneath the power lines where we use those in conjunction with a controlled burn uh, in proximity to those power lines to be able to, to further refine the, uh, what the, the fire profile looks like. Next slide, please. All right, uh, and here you see the evacuation decision support tool. So that's that output of all these inputs. So we have a ignition point shown by the triangle on top right. 
we have uh, real time weather and uh, specifically wind speed, wind direction, and RH and temperature to a lesser degree. And we understand the fuel model and topography in advance. And, and here we run uh, projected fire spread showing the impact on uh, which evacuation zones will see the fire. Uh, one of the sort of interesting outputs of this research was that knowing where the fire is going to go is not particularly helpful if you don't have a predetermined way that allows you to rapidly communicate what this amoeba looks like with regard to, um, to the residents that you need to evacuate. So the, the so what uh, of a fire is um, we need to know where it's going and who it's going to impact. We need to be able to rapidly explain that to other people who don't necessarily have the same. We often speak in commonplace names uh, and that people who've worked in an area have their own code. Uh, just as a sidebar, Jenny, are you tracking the fire in your area running up towards 680? Yep. Anyway, uh, Jenny Biggs, there's a fire burning up out of San Anselmo towards the 680 trail. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this yes. is how we start. Sorry, Dave. Okay. All right, just wanted, audio, wanted to make sure. Challenges. Oh, no problem. Um, I keep getting alerts saying there's a there's a fire there. Um, so the, the next thing then becomes how do we how do we inform our evacuation decisions? Because knowing where the fire is going to go and knowing which residents are in its path are one thing, but the next thing is how do we responsibly inform them about what they should do? And so what we see here is this is coincident route analysis where we give each roof in an area a value of one, and we assume there's one vehicle coming out of that out of that roof to evacuate, and certainly. That may not always be the case, but it's good for planning assumptions. And then we, we model where are the intersections where these are going to meet, which starts to tell you where your choke points are. And that becomes a, a really good decision support tool to indicate to law enforcement where they should put their limited resources for traffic control. But on the left, we see here, what one of the, when do we know that eva ordered evacuations are gonna exceed that surface street capacity? Because if we leave people in a home that has been hardened in defensible space, which is not only a best practice, but it's a legal requirement, it's the law, the fire code says you have to have defensible space if you live in a hazard severity zone. But if we leave people in their homes, houses are inherently fire resistive. And while we certainly would like to evacuate them if that is an option, there will come a point where the evacuation route is so congested that they're demonstrably safer if they stay in their homes rather than in their cars, which are inherently combustive, particularly when caught in a traffic jam if you haven't done fuel mitigation work to harden those evacuation road sites. So we, we played around a little bit with being responsible about understanding what are the impacts. If we just tell everyone to run for it, we may have made them less safe. So we want to be smart about making time-phased and prioritized evacuations. Next slide, please with an emphasis on allowing those who are closest to the fire the most time to get out. So what you see here is this is a, a traffic flow model. It's, it's just a, a flow analyzer um, for the district where we, we, we took a um, analysis of the most direct route to a freeway. So for our purposes, getting evacuate, or being evacuated means you made it to Highway 24. So the first thing we did is we worked out the primary evacuation route for every location, and those get grouped into watersheds, if you will. So think of each one of those color-coded squiggly lines there. That is a watershed where every house or every human that lives on the road network that is of that same color, they all drain out through the same watershed to a common freeway on-ramp where we, we stop being concerned about their evacuation status. And so then the underlying colors are what is the estimated travel time from their location to the freeway. So on the bottom right, you see those are dark red. Those guys are gonna have the longest travel time. And so we know if we have ordered them to evacuate, it's gonna take them up to 14 minutes to reach the freeway. We know we should wait at least 14 minutes until we order the people that are closest to the freeway to evacuate with all sorts of gradations in between. So that we basically hold open the door for those who are closest to the point of danger to the fire, we give them a chance to get out past those choke points before we order downstream evacuations, which are going to predictably congest the route. And in that way, we managed, we, we attempt to inform our evacuation order decisions so that we don't make things worse by ordering people to evacuate onto a road that's congested because we told people who were not yet at risk that they should leave. Next slide, please. 
which then leads itself to enhanced evacuation routes, specifically contraflow. And this is the scenario we used for a, um, a live full-scale evacuation exercise we ran a couple of years ago, where we set up contraflow routes and we flowed people out. In this case, red going from right to left, that's Moraga Way. We're holding that open with contraflow for evacuees. And then on the right in red is Moraga Road that was closed for evacuation and used exclusively for first responders. So we flow residents out to the left and fire engines in from the right as a way to, to try to deconflict the available, use of the available road space and make them all single direction, to make a more efficient flow. Next slide, please. And then using, uh, here's a screenshot from that same evacuation exercise where we showed a road closure um, for uh, Moraga Road, or sorry, Moraga Way, which then showed up in Apple Maps and Ways that now showed routing around that section of road. So playing around with some of these existing traffic routing and traffic optimization apps that uh, if Ways can efficiently get a million people in and out of San Francisco on a daily basis, it could absolutely be leveraged to move people in, or, uh, resource, fire responding resources in and residents out of an area that's affected by wildfire, which moves towards the gold standard of personalized evacuation recommendations. Next slide, please. Which leads me to my next steps. So where, where I see the, the problem set and, and where we're moving, um, there, there's some things having to do with social policy that I think are probably a little more outside the, this group's interest, uh, having to do with how we compel good behavior. Now that we have a very good understanding of what we can do to prevent homes from burning, ember resistant construction standard and retrofits, uh, mostly very low cost, defensible space, which is just landscaping and gardening. It, it's not, there's no science there. You clear the things that will burn away from your house, your house is less likely to burn. It's, it's that simple. But in the science side, what, <clears throat> where, where I think the, the next steps are is, is really hammering down on that persistent observation solution, whatever that may be. So a reliable, all-weather, rugged, low-cost thing that will see fires when they are small and rapidly share that information with the end, the end users. Um, I, having spent a lot of time uh, in the Marine Corps and remaining uh, in the reserves, I cannot tell you how many times I have to beat my head against the wall when someone explains to me that Hawkeye or some other high-end system has got all this data, but they just can't share it. That means it has no value. I, I could care less if Hawkeye can see a little tiny fire, but if they're not able to tell the people who are responding to it, it has zero value. So we need low side stuff that can be shared with responders in real time with a simple, simple filtering that's catching false reports such as a refinery flare or a large barbecue or things like that so that we have a, a real time understanding of where the fire is. We do not currently have that. Modus and VERS are updated, but not in real time. And they regularly have either parallax, parallax errors or they pick up the column when it's laid down showing fire spread in a manner that does not match the reality on the ground. So I think there's more work to be done there. There's also more work to be done on modeling uh, fire spread. Um, first thing, from my perspective, I have a little bit of a fascination with understory, understory fuel modeling, because if you look at the fuel that is most likely to carry the fire, particularly in the WUI and just about anywhere other than the Great Basin, it's not the tree canopy, it's the understory fuels. And aerial collection does a very poor job of accurately modeling at, say, the five meter or sub meter level, accurately mod mod modeling and, um, and categorizing understory fuels. And without those, it's very, very difficult to, one, show the value of defensible space work that has been done, and two, to accurately predict the fire spread. There's also a lot of work to be done in an understanding of how buildings can behave as a fuel model. Uh, in Santa Rosa and Coffee Park, buildings were the fuel most likely to carry the fire. Uh, there is very little has been done in that space to accurately show buildings as the primary fuel model, primarily because it doesn't happen very often. And then uh, more surface street capacity modeling. I, I think a lot of this is out there uh, amongst traffic engineers and so forth. I've just seen very little of that being integrated with our understanding of fire spread and what are the impacts of smoke and embers down to the ground and the chaos of people trying to escape. What impacts do, that ha do those have on the efficiency of outflows of residents and what are the low cost, high impact measures such as roadside fuel reduction or uh, the ability to trigger flashing green, flashing red for traffic signals. Uh, there are quite a few areas, mine included, where flashing green is not an option. The signals either operate in, in, in their normal manner or they operate in flashing red. Evacuees when faced with a flashing red light will most likely stop. That will bottleneck the, the outflow of people um, in no time whatsoever. 
And then, um, as I mentioned previously, that real-time personalized evacuation routing suggestions. So um, a thing that can be informed by the local officials who have an understanding where the fire is, that you as a resident can pop up, can open up the app, and the app will tell you, um, this is your best route to go. And or the best route is that you take no route and that you sit tight because it's, I don't know, it's 10x normal travel time to the safety zone. Um, traffic is not moving and there are potential fire impacts within the next 60 minutes on your route. And this routing software suggests you will not make it past that point in the next 60 minutes. Therefore, you should shelter in place. And I hope you did your defensible space and home hardening in advance. Um, there's also, I think, opportunities for novel use of existing infrastructure for firefighting, specifically um, residential exterior irrigation systems. For years and years, we have said, and this remains true, that you should not turn on your sprinklers when you evacuate. But some of that's old tech because it's based on the assumption that it's a binary yes, no, sprinklers on, sprinklers off. And if you go to evacuate and you turn your sprinklers on, they might run for five days without the fire ever coming near you. However, in the current environment, with the prevalence of smart home hubs and web-enabled things, it's now very likely that a number of homes in a fire's path have the ability to cycle sprinklers on and off remotely. Uh, as a fire chief, I would love nothing more than to have control of those sprinklers so that as a fire got to an area, I could cycle sprinklers on specifically like misters and bubblers right next to the house to wet down that receptive fuel bed within two to five feet of the home. That would be a great use of water. Um, however, uh, we've been unable to get anyone to bite on utilizing existing Toro, Hunter, uh, any of the existing web enabled um, sprinkler or irrigation control systems, no one will touch it when it comes to fire because of liability. I literally have had people hang up on me as soon as I said fire. Um, so there are opportunities there to use existing infrastructure, existing control mechanisms, just in a novel manner. Um, but part of that integrates with everything I mentioned before about an accurate understanding of where a fire is and where it's going to be. And all of this driving towards the goal of integration of either existing or systems that will be developed to generate near real-time results and outputs that are simple, that will work in a field environment and are digestible by, by technophobes or Neanderthals. And at the end of the day, we're talking about uh, folks who have a deep-seated and well-earned distrust of technology and always have an option to go analog, specifically on the radio and a pen and paper. And so these systems have to create outputs that are formatted in a manner that they are digestible to fire, frontline firefighting folks, many of whom are not sophisticated consumers of technology, but all of whom have a smartphone and know how to use various social media apps. So, so really thinking to, to putting some of that engineering that has gone into making the um, social media platforms accessible to people who don't like or trust or are, are sophisticated tech consumers to make it uh, digestible by them. All of these things have to land in that same common output so that the, the knuckle draggers would be willing to use it. Otherwise, these are interesting things that we can talk about at conferences, but we'll just have no value uh, in the field where um, quite frankly, there, there are not a lot of tech PhDs um, pointing a hose at the fire. And we need to think who the end user is in this case. Uh, I know that was a lot. I, I really appreciate your, uh, your patience with hearing sort of our around the world. And as I did mention at the, the top, uh, I would really like to thank Jenny and the Moore Foundation. They, they've been, um, tremendously generous with both not only their support, but more importantly, with the contacts and the introductions that have put us in touch with some really smart people who are worrying on this problem that have allowed us to leverage some of our ideas against what is possible. So Jenny, we really appreciate it as always. And uh, I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions or see the floor. Well, thanks, Dave. Uh, I found that fascinating stuff that you, you've been doing. Um, we probably have, we have time for one quick question before we move to Scotty, and we hopefully will have time at the end uh, for more uh, discussion. Uh, so yeah. this is Brian. I, I'll just, I, Dave, a very quick question. Um, I refer back to your mentioning earlier about a decision support system. You, you said something to the effect that um, one of the data, uh, one of the data uh, uh, temperature, I think in particular, you, you said temperature was was not available to the decision support system to a lesser degree. And I was wondering if you could expound on that a little bit. I, I don't know if you remember the exact point at which you said um, uh, temperature to a lesser degree. 
Yeah, so that it, temperature is just not that relevant to fire spread. Um, temperature's impact on relative humidity is, but if you look at, you know, some of our worst fires occur on, well, it's, uh, you know, it's 32 degrees where I am right now, and there's, there's still some fire burning. And if you look at the fall fires, temp will be up a little bit, but not by much. It's really that the, the high wind speed and the low RH. And so while temperature is interesting, it's temperature's impact on RH that's much more relevant. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, so again, we hopefully we'll have time afterwards uh, uh, have more discussion. So, uh, Scotty, uh, let's see, I'm gonna hand it off to you. You're gonna share your screen, right? Okay. So it's good here. There we go. Sorry, the, the Zoom application went to my other window. All right. So um, I think thanks, Dave, for really comprehensive and detailed overview of the problem set that the communities are facing. And, you know, I think, you know, what I'm going to do here is try to familiarize this cluster with some of the tech and tech related conversations that my cluster and enviro sensing has been having so i'm really the messenger here and what you know this is going to be really fast based on how much time we have left but what i'm hoping that this sets up are further interactions in within esip for sure and i'm sure this cluster and, and dave will continue to to converse on this uh, in a in another context, but you know, at least within ESIP between our two working groups, um, I hope this sets up some conversations about where we see some overlap here. And and two things really jumped out at me from you know the the big picture of Dave's presentation, and that's the software and the networks. And I'll touch on both of those uh, in the course of this quick overview. So. Um, the Enviro Sensing Cluster is another work group in ESIP. I'm representing it as one of the co-chairs. I'm going to go ahead and just start advancing, maybe. There we go. Um, my co-chairs include Joseph Bell from the USGS and Martha Apple from Montana Tech. Martha is on the call today. Um, and I know that some others that are part of this group have participated with this. Uh, Bar, for example, is, is definitely presented in our cluster a few times. So. You know, these are these are areas of technologies where I think there's a lot of overlap to the fire problem. We haven't been working on the fire problem, but it's good that ESIP start thinking about this. What I'm hoping is that our cluster can work together with you guys on a joint session in an ESIP meeting this winter, where we start to flesh out not only the knowledge graph, knowledge database that um, that uh, Bill and Brian are after, but also uh, start talking about what are some of the pieces of low-hanging fruit that we might be able to attack together, at least within our group. So I'm going to show just examples of what our cluster people have been working on. And I'm not going to go into the details because we don't have time, but this will give you a very quick flash overview. And this won't be comprehensive of everyone in our cluster and doing all the things, but low power um, and versatile, uh, low-cost systems to do sensing. So that's that's one of the things that we're working on. This is an example from uh, one of Martha's students' recent presentations uh, where they're integrating um, various off-the-shelf and custom electronics components to try to do, uh, in this case, uh, soil moisture monitoring um, in Glacier National Park where criteria include survivability over the winter at high elevation, and non-visibility to visitors and things like that. So, you know, this is this is one of these interesting intersections of uh, sensor deployments that I think is going to be useful for things like fire sensing um, issues. You know, that you run across when we start talking about sensors and data logging include: Do you have the ability to do uh, to have real-time clock on board and data logging in case you lose connectivity? Is there an integrated connection for solar power, et cetera, et cetera? So folks like John Porter here um, are, are also working and, and discovering what's out there, what's available off the shelf, or what can we build that starts to integrate these different requirements for environmental sensing. Um, Daniel Fuca at Virginia Tech 
has been playing with very low cost, very low power, but uh, highly capable um, combinations of hardware. In this case, including um, onboard uh, LoRa radios, which um, you know, there's a number of people in our cluster that are working with the LoRa technologies um, because they're showing the, the LoRa technology is showing promise to go much further, even with partially obstructed um, RF paths to deliver um, key, uh, key data um, from even uh, under canopy conditions. And so um, this is a radio technology that our cluster is working on, I think would show a lot of promise for some of the distributed sensing applications in fire. Um, let's see here, networks. So I said I'd mention the networks. Um, you know, so where, where Dave's working is a highly connected, highly technologically enhanced region. The Bay Area has got to be one of the, you know, most connected parts of the United States. Um, as soon as you go to other parts of California, and Dave mentioned, you know, the campfire. Um, actually, my sister is one of the evacuees. They lost their home in that fire. That was kind of an interesting time. Um, but yeah, the campfire, for example, that region didn't have the best connectivity. And in fact, depending on where your fire is, if you burn over um, utility uh, or cellular providers, uh, you may have large portions of the population or homes that will lose their connectivity. And so considering what the network is in an urban wildland interface and what's available to do not only the communication out to users, but also communication to emergency responders over um, uh, various public safety networks. And then what can be layered on top of that as far as best practices for sensing or even secondary communications paths. Uh, this is a problem, this, this network problem is something that I think we're only just starting to wrestle with from an agency, and I mean like national uh, public lands agency or, or um, resource agencies perspective. Um, and so I, I, I work on this you know, wide area network that's used for research and uh, service hazards service in Nevada. Um, but, you know, you can extend that, that uh, virtual or let's say logical network to uh, anywhere where there's internet connectivity. And so you can see all these on this particular map, um, all of these red towers are places where there's a local WISP or, or connectivity provider that you can land the virtual network for your sensors or your comms, or in this case, the fire cameras on top of. And, and what it does is it, it allows you to extend the footprint of your data flows in creative ways that might have more resilience uh, when it comes time for you know, sites to get burned over or power to be shut off and things like that. And so there's a lot of thought that needs to be put into what the networks to do these various uh, services could look like and how that can develop. Um, for example, you know, this is a, you know, a, a diagram of some of the research networks that I work on in Nevada, um, where we have fire and hazard cameras, we have weather and climate stations, we have smart traffic infrastructures, and we're using a very similar high level topology where we have uh, the edge or the, the last mile, we have data aggregation and distribution or the middle mile, and then we have data center services, which could be in the cloud or it could be on-premise at, you know, in my case, at uh, university data centers. Um, and, and this, you think about this both from a network distribution perspective, as well as a physical infrastructure distribution perspective, which includes the sensors, your uh, edge computing, um, your intelligence at the edge, and then the same things at aggregation points. And your aggregation points can also be where you have gateways for different network technologies. For example, you can have gateways for LoRa networks that branch off of high-speed IP networks, et cetera. And so that this is, this is more of a breakdown getting into network design and, and deployment that um, I think we can think about uh, for wildfire applications. Now, software. Um, Dave mentioned leveraging all of the technology that's been built for social media applications. And I think he's spot on. I think that there's a ton of mature tech out there that could be very useful for this. When it comes to the backend data management for scientifically based observation, we tend to think about things um, 
kind of from our own legacy perspective. So this is an early diagram from our group that was a, uh, you know, a few years ago, this was like a best practice for a data workflow. And I don't, you know, we're not going to walk through this right now because we don't have time. But this gives you an example of how we think about how to handle um, multi-application scientifically based sensor observations from end to end. Uh, here's another way to look at this um, from end to end and, and some of the distances involved where you have different Net, uh, different software tools functioning at different points on the network, both in terms of like distance distribution, but uh, also proximity to the edge and what you're trying to do. So there, there are some roles of software, there's some roles of personnel in here, and what you need, and then there's roles of stakeholders. And this is something that could certainly be updated for fire. I think I put this diagram together for uh, climate applications, but um, for fire, you could certainly make some modifications. Uh, this is an example of smart cities type um, software workflows for um, some, some uh, uh, smart mobility work that we're doing at UNR. And, and our group is also, uh, we've got people that are looking at this where you, you want to be able to do store and forward transportation and um, you know, uh, apply some intelligence and early analysis at the edge. Um, exactly what does that look like and how do you deploy it and what is the footprint on compute um, it are good questions and how to make these stacks more efficient. It's another area of inquiry and investigation that I think even commercial entities are still trying to wrap their heads around as this kind of technology develops. One of our uh, members, um, Colin Boda at Berkeley, has um, developed a very nice time series data management and sensor curation system called Dendra. And he's presented this not only in our cluster, but at AGU recently. And, and this is a software stack designed for cloud deployment that has tons of potential for scalable management and uh, quality control um, of sensor data. And so this is, um, you know, this is a, a very cool system that I think might have application as well. And, and so you know, this is, a, again, a software system where they're thinking about the system management of the sensor networks, the curation and quality control for both scientific and immediate application purposes, and the data repository um, that you want to go back in and look at for forensics purposes or to leverage for science in the future. Um, I think that some of the outstanding questions that we're, that we're really being faced with now and that Dave has brought up is, how do you fuse these systems together to create value, immediate value for different kinds of stakeholders? And so one of our cluster members, in fact, our, a former student fellow who's now a professor at uh, University of Texas, Austin, Matt Bartos, has been playing with this for smart civil engineering watersheds um, in his work. And I'm sure he could talk about it for a very long time. But essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to fuse observations, modeling, and then um, applying it immediately to real-time control so that you change the state of the system. And that was something that Dave was getting at when you, when you start talking about um, you know, residential or, or even you know, uh, uh, local you know, parks and civil agency control irrigation systems that if you can start turning those on and off in response to what you're seeing happening um, in your common operating picture, you can change, perhaps change the state of the, the fire and have, a, have an impact on the outcomes there. And so, you know, finally, I, I think what I'm gonna show here is that, you know, this systems fusion and the integration of all these different tech technologies and, and um, and test beds uh, is, is being approached in the USGS. So this is Joseph Bell's group um, at the Next Generation Water Observing System where they're thinking about this not for fire, but instead for watersheds. And that includes not just the water resources, but hazards, you know, flooding, for example. And, and how do you apply all of these different technologies and make the cyber infrastructure function um, in a way that creates value both in the long term, but also in the short term. And that includes fusing in situ sensors with advanced um, terrestrial or uh, let's say drone based. And as you know, low earth orbit satellites start becoming available to us, 
fusing all of those data together and, and how do you process, how do you refine your, for example, how do you refine your machine learning models in real time? What's the workflow for that um, to analyze, uh, you know, things like, you know, passive imagery from uh, multi-spectral uh, sensors and things of that nature. So, you know, there's a lot of cool problems to solve in this space. And I think um, that, you know, it's probably a lot bigger than these two clusters can tackle, but I think there's some, some low hanging fruit and there's a lot of expertise in the room between the two working groups uh, working on active projects that can contribute to uh, you know, solving some of these problems in the long term. So I'm gonna go ahead and get out of here. And it looks like I stayed within time. And uh, you know, like I said, I'm just the messenger here um, for my group. There's a lot of people that, that are playing in these spaces for scientific purposes. Um, and of course, when you stack wildfire on top of it, it adds another sense of urgency. So thanks, Bill and Brian, for uh, hosting us and for getting this uh, inner cluster collaboration going. And of course, thank you, Dave and Jenny, for coming in and being the stakeholders in the room. Um, it's not often that ESIP gets to hear very comprehensive stakeholder picture. And, and you've presented something that has a lot of value. And I'm glad that this conversation got recorded to the cloud because I'd like to play it back for our group. And anyway, back to you, Bill. Great, thanks, Scotty. Uh, that was really, really interesting. So um, yeah, we have two minutes, so we're not going to be able to <laughs> do any kind of extended discussion. But um, and we'll, we'll, we definitely will be following up, you know, with everybody afterwards. But we do have uh, maybe time for one or maybe two quick questions. Uh, if anybody uh, wants to post them now. Well, I'm going to pose one quick one to Dave. Um, so you mentioned that um, the use of fire detection right, from these ground sensors is mostly uh, like in the ur urban uh, wildland interface, you know, in, in next to residential areas. But if information about detection is available elsewhere in the remote areas, is there anything that uh, can be done with that knowledge, even if it's available? Well, I, I think that the point with ground-based detection really had to do with the required density and the, the maintenance requirements that come along with that. I, I mean, it would work in a, in a wilderness setting, but in a wilderness setting, there, the imperative isn't quite the same because you, you have a little more time for things to spread. And I, I think just due to the vastness of the landscape, it lends itself to remote sensing, specifically um, low Earth orbit satellites. Uh, but the, the point of the, with that diagram and so forth, it's agnostic of the source of ignition detection, uh, whether that be a sensor, a satellite, an aircraft, a person driving down the road, um, uh, whatever it may be. The, the process, once you know where a fire is, is the same. And I, I think that really is validation and then near real time modeling and then response, or in some cases, no response, because I, I, I'm working on, a, I don't quite have a way to articulate it down just yet, but the thought is forming that the fires fall into a couple different categories. And, and one is fires that should not be put out. And so relatively small or slow moving fires under positive conditions, we should allow those fires to burn. And, and we culturally need to start driving home the importance of the need for that. And then the next is large fires that are slow moving where there's plenty of time to figure out where they are and what they're doing because you're not gonna put them out anyway. So a, a fire well-established in timber, uh, that fire is gonna burn until it runs out of fuel or until it rains or snows. So you're just not going to stop it. But then the last category, which is the one we're really focused on in the district is those uh, fast moving wind driven fires in proximity to urban areas. And those, every second counts on those. And that's really where our attention is focused. And I think that's where the application of ground-based sensors has the most value. Thanks, Dave. Um, uh, this is Josh Lieberman. Could I ask about the sort of intermediate zone? I know, you know, there's human observers. I wonder if you've been able to work with, you know, um, <clears throat> mounted camera systems that give you some, you know, miles long overview, but are automated in terms of their detection of smoke and so on. Absolutely. So the the, the UNR uh, Alert Wildfire Network uh, has recently been partnered with an algorithm that's very effective at detecting smoke. 
Uh, in fact, the alerts I was getting about the fires in San Anselmo while I was talking were coming in on text messages while I was giving the presentation on the phone. Uh, not only the presence of the fire, but then a, um, a, a camera shot that you can allows you to interrogate the, the picture to, to apply some human sense to it. I think those are very good, but they do come with some limitations. Specifically, if you recall, for those in the Bay Area, last year uh, we had you know, weeks on end where the smoke filled skies. It's very, very difficult for a camera to pick up a fire when the, when the smoke is already, you know, the smoke's how you see a fire with a camera. And if the, yeah. the sky is already full of low hanging smoke, it's really difficult to figure out where the new smoke is uh, in the midst of that. Um, so, I, I, I mean, it's all of the above. We're ag agnostic of how we get it, but I'm, I'm really hung up on Leo's being the right answer because as those things, as the constellation density increases and they're flying lower, the size of the camera you need on them becomes much less complex. Uh, so, you know, sort of a, a high-end iPhone camera on a low earth, on a low flying thing might be enough to say, hey, there's a fire there, um, either in IR or near IR, but more realistically based on smoke detection because it's such a big signature. Okay, um, thanks Dave. So we are two minutes <laughs> past the hour. So I, I you know, want to respect everybody's time. So. Uh, so we will follow up with everybody. Uh, we definitely want to uh, wish you Dave to uh, to see if what we do can uh, have some benefit uh, to do what you're doing, and also with Scotty. So we will be exploring uh, in terms of the winter meeting uh, coming up to see what we can do collab collaboratively. So uh, yeah, so thanks again to both uh, Chief Winnegar and Scotty uh, Strachan for uh, taking time out of your busy uh, schedule to uh, uh, present uh, some of the work that you're doing. So we will be in touch, okay? Thank you very much, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.